here. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, my name is Eric Galinka and I'm the community manager for the COVID-19 Cyber Threat Coalition. Uh, and this is our weekly town hall. So today, uh, I'm just going to go over a few things, a little welcome or welcome back. Uh, Josh is going to take us through a mission update, and then Emily will talk about the threat advisory that her team put out. And then we'll have our guest speakers, Morgan and Jose from Census, uh, talk with us, and then we'll take your Q&A. So if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Uh, otherwise, welcome back. Thank you for being here. Uh, I pulled this bit from our website, but you know, I just wanted to cover a little bit uh, about who we are. So we're an all volunteer community. Uh, we're trying to step up and focus on cybersecurity while the threat, while the uh, threat landscape is changing in response to our exposure changing, right? We have a lot more people working from home. There are some technologies being adopted, deployed, and used that are relatively new. And so attackers are adapting to our adaptations to those changes. Um, so we're a group of cybersecurity experts, uh, some of us less expert than others. Oh, that's me. Uh, you know, data scientists, malware analysts, uh, we're a motley crew. Uh, and you know, we're just trying to make the world a little bit safer. And if you want to read our much more eloquent mission statement, you can always uh, click that link and check out our website, uh, which please do, please. We would love more web traffic, please do that. Um, and you can join us. You can either try and type this link really fast, um, which I would be surprised and impressed if anybody manages to do that, please DM me if you do. Uh, I'll be really impressed. Uh, or you can just follow us on Twitter at, at Throat Coalition or go to our website and join our Slack there. Um, we would really love to have more people joining us, participating, uh, and all that. So, you know, like I said, welcome or welcome back. Um, and if you have, if you know someone who would like to join us, uh, know someone who might not want to join us, but would just do it anyway. Uh, tell them to. Send them the link. Copy this link. Uh, yeah. All right. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Josh to talk a little bit about our, uh, our mission. I'm going to stop sharing for you. Oh, sorry. I thought we were uh, here. I can, I can share. I can, I can share. If you don't mind, if you mind resharing, yeah, it would probably be yeah, easier. I, sure. It's easy for and me. I, and I'm going to get super right one. formal and stop watching, walking on my treadmill desk while, while I talk. Um, OK, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our progress. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about our mission. And then I'm going to talk about our, our progress in pursuing that mission. Um, so uh, one way of thinking about the premise of, of what we're doing here is uh, folks are, are are distressed in lots of different ways right now because of the pandemic and the accompanying economic meltdown. Um, I'm sure most of us, if we were healthcare professionals, we would be jumping in and, and helping in that in the most direct possible way. But we're cybersecurity professionals, and the best way we can help is by ensuring that while folks are dealing with um, missed paychecks, sick family members, and other impacts of the pandemic, they also aren't dealing with um, successful cyber attacks, ransomware attacks, identity theft, uh, those kinds of uh, unfortunate events. Um, so our role here is to help society stay as resilient as possible in the midst of a lot of, a, a lot of stress from a lot of different directions. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Eric. And we've got a few ways that we're, we're doing that here. Uh, these, these bullets really get at the heart of our mission. Uh, one is we're, we're distilling the threat intel that we get from the community here and, and also from uh, other industry donors down, down to a block list that can be easily integrated into uh, folks' security deployments, so firewalls, endpoint technologies, that kind of thing. The block list gets updated every 10 minutes. You can go to our website for more information about how to access it. Uh, second uh, point, we release a, a weekly threat advisory, which and it, which Emily um, is instrumental in getting done every week. She's going to present in a few minutes about that. Um, the idea is to help folks in positions of 
uh, in IT security positions understand how the threat landscape is evolving so that they can um, adjust their security posture accordingly. Uh, third, we, as everybody knows, we run a Slack community. It's got, I think now it's got about 3,700 people in it. And the idea is that as, as security professionals, we're all social network together in various ways. We, we wanna help densify that network so that the transit time when messages need to be sent from uh, one expert to another just go way down. That's why we bring people together on Slack, allow people to discover one another, right? So if, you need, if, you, if you're dealing with a, an attack that uses uh, uh, IT, like internet infrastructure that needs to get shut down, our Slack is a great place to meet uh, folks from law enforcement who might be able to connect you to the right person to do that, or folks from registrars um, and other relevant organizations. Uh, we also do, Nick heads up our uh, media and public relations efforts. We try to amplify everything we're doing here uh, via media. We've been covered in um, this last week, NBC, um, CSO Online, lots of different high profile uh, folks have been covering us. And that's, that's instrumental to what we're doing here because we want to, um, our we want to amplify what we're doing. Our block list is only as effective as the number of people who actually adopt it, et cetera. Uh, and then we run this weekly town hall, which you guys are at right now. Um, so those are, those are the key activities of, of CCTC right now. I can go to the next slide, Eric. Uh, here are some metrics. Uh, we, we try to measure ourselves. So here are some metrics showing, showing how we're doing. Uh, when we first started our block list, we, we had a trickle of folks uh, uh, pulling it down. Now we're seeing uh, roughly a thousand unique IPs per day, pulling it down. That's what we're seeing over the last two weeks. Uh, uni unique IPs um, over those last two weeks, 16.5K. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, we, uh, we collect uh, threat intelligence in computer readable form uh, using Alien Vault Open Threat Exchange. Uh, we've got some some really helpful volunteers from, from OTX who've been helping us do that. Uh, we've got 621 members there and people have, there, there are 266 pulses, which are kind of like thread until documents that can contain um, any number of IOCs uh, that people have posted there. Uh, you can go to our website for more information about how to get involved there. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, our Slack is, initially there was a, a big burst of activity right after we started our Slack about a month ago. Um, uh, our membership has grown, um, but I'd say our participation is, has reached kind of a steady state. Uh, so we've got, when, when I pulled this chart, uh, we were showing 3,500 members, it's more now, but um, about a third of those are active every week. Uh, we've got 31 channels and you can, see, you can see the dynamics of people's participation. Uh, we encourage everybody to participate as much as possible, Con contribute what you're seeing, even if you think it's not super significant, it may be significant to somebody else. Um, invite other folks. Uh, we really want uh, our Slack to, to continue to be a beehive of activity around threat intel in our community. So you can go to the next slide, Eric. Um, and our website is doing pretty well, um, roughly, roughly steady state. We'd like to see these numbers go up, but um, we're getting a healthy number of visits. So. 15.4K in the last two weeks. And you can go to the next slides. Um, Twitter, similar. Uh, I think we've got 1,200 followers um, and it's, it's been a good tool for us. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, okay, I think this is my last slide. So, so we would love for folks on the call today to get involved. Uh, we have a kind of pyramid model for how we run this organization. Uh, we've got a broad audience in our public Slack channels. We, we make it um, very low friction to join, and that's by design. Uh, those channels um, are um, unvetted. So th there, there are pros and cons to that, but that's, that's the nature of our, of our public channels, and we try to make it really easy for lots and lots of people to join. I think of the security level as similar to that of, like, if you go to DEF CON or something like that. So... Um, then we've got a vetted volunteer pool. I think we've got more than 100 people now there, but we, we vet people. You can get in touch with me if you'd like to get, to get vetted and, we, and the security level is a bit higher and the vetted channels. And, and uh, out of that group, there's lots and lots of volunteers who basically um, do the work of this organization. And then there's a steering committee. So for folks who've been volunteering for a little while, you can talk to, um, you can talk to us about joining the steering committee. Happy to have more people. Um, that's the group that, that really, um, keeps the lights on um, and uh, works all, we, we we're involved almost every day, probably every day in the work of the coalition. Um, 
I think that's it. I'm, I, let me go to the next slide, Eric. Yeah, so that's an overview of our mission, what we're up to, how well we're doing. Um, I'd say that to me that the high level takeaway here is, is we've built something that uh, is, that's proven not to be a, a flash in the pan. There wasn't just a two week burst of activity and then we were gone, right? We've built something durable. Um, we have sustained activity every week. Um, we have we have great uptime around our block list. Every week the threat advisory comes out, every week we do a town hall. Um, now the question is how do we grow that as this crisis deepens and um, becomes even more negatively impactful to our societies so we can do something um, much more impactful than what we've done so far, which I think has been been great. Um, I think our, our the, the future looks, um, I think I think our, our best accomplishments are ahead of us. So I hope that folks get involved and uh, you can reach out to any of us about that. So thanks. Cool. Emily, would um, you like it, to take over? Uh, if you wouldn't mind continuing, that would be awesome, but I'm happy to, to take control too. If you need no to. problem at all. I got it. Cool. All right, cool. Um, so yeah, I'm Emily. Um, I help head up the Threat Advisory Group, and I'm going to give a rundown of some of the stories and original research that we published this week, um, just to kind of go over some of the high points and talk about um, some of the awesome work we've done on the team. So um, next slide, please. So um, if you've been following our advisories for the last few weeks, you've probably seen us cover COVID-related domain trends in the past. Um, and so we wanna keep providing updates around that because it's a particularly interesting um, thing that we can look at, particularly given that we have members of the group who have access to this data that they have graciously shared with us. Um, so this graph, if you haven't seen one like it before, um, this illustrates COVID or coronavirus related domains registered per day since the beginning of the year, roughly the beginning of the year. Um, the red line indicates a count of domains that are deemed likely malicious based on domain tools algorithms, um, while the blue line indicates domain registrations that are likely benign. So last week, we reported that there appeared to be a bit of a plateau in new COVID-related domain registrations. Um, and this actually continued. You can, you can see now it's kind of falling off pretty, pretty dramatically um, where it's tapering. And there could be a couple of different things going on. Um, one, it's possible, I think we maybe mentioned this last week too, um, but it's possible that attackers have, they've gotten what they've needed. Like they've been successful at phishing and spam and distributing malware. Um, and now they're moving to the next steps in exploitation. So they don't need to keep registering domains. Um, it's also entirely possible that, I mean, like if you look at that spike, the red line spike around uh, mid-March, you know, we probably reached some sort of saturation point in domains that actually look legitimate and are related to coronavirus or COVID. So there's only so many you know, permutations of that out there. So that's possible as well. Um, but a third alternative that we've considered is that they could be pivoting to slightly different avenues. Um, next slide, please. So uh, these are domain registrations from at the beginning of the year, broken down by a couple of different tokens or strings related to the pandemic. Um, you can see coronavirus, COVID-19, mask, N95. Um, it's important to point out that unlike the previous graph, this one makes no distinction between um, likely malicious or likely benign domains. Um, but it's, so it's very likely that um, many of these are legitimate domains. Um, but I want to draw your attention to the really large spike at the beginning of April for mask-related uh, terms in domains. Now, it's possible that a lot of these are legitimate, you know, charities or organizations helping healthcare workers, um, legitimate places to purchase masks. But actually, if you can flip back to the previous slide for just a moment. So I want to draw your attention to the spike in the blue line um, around March 30th. So you'll see that these, this was kind of the spike in legitimate-looking domains that we saw. And you'll notice that it trailed by about three weeks, maybe close to a month, um, the, the big uh, upswing in malicious looking domains. So it's very likely um, that a lot of these new mask related domains are in fact malicious and are going to be used for um, nefarious purposes. So while we don't know for sure, it just based on data we've seen before, it's, it's pretty likely. Um, next slide, please. You can go to one more. Cool. 
Um, so shifting gears a little bit, we've seen increasing collaboration between um, government employees, elected officials, and the security community at large during the pandemic. So, I, and I don't just mean like the, the cyber threat coalition that we're, we're all part of, but more generally as well, the security community has a lot to offer right now. Um, and I think a lot of elected officials, government employees, uh, they're realizing this. Um, in fact, one example of this is how New York State has reached out to six of the largest domain registrars and asked them to increase scrutiny around coronavirus related domain registrations. So they've asked for things like um, more automated and human reviews on uh, newly registered domains. They've requested special channels for um, law enforcement and other government employees to get in contact with their abuse desks, um, different measures like that. And so several registrars responded. Um, Namecheap has openly said that they're increasing proactive measures. Um, you know, and, and other registrars have been really responsive, uh, but they've said that they are gonna rely on abuse reporting mechanisms that they currently have in place. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this changes as things go along, see if other registrars are uh, encouraged to adopt new mechanisms as well. Next slide, please. And Zoom, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't go another week without talking about Zoom. Um, so <laughs> since coronavirus, this whole thing started, um, Zoom's customer base has exploded. Um, they've gone through a tremendous amount of growth in a really short period of time. And um, that's also given them a lot of extra scrutiny around different security vulnerabilities that they've had. And there has been no shortage of those, right? Like we've seen Windows-based credential stealing malware. We've seen vulnerabilities in the Mac OS Zoom client. We've seen encryption issues, Zoom bombing, um, user data issues. I mean, pretty much any type of vulnerability or security issue you wanna have or you'd like to talk about, like whether it has to do with data privacy and protection, whether it's actual code-based vulnerabilities, business logic flaws, they've seen all of these types of things. Um, and it's been so severe that some organizations have shifted away from using Zoom and have banned it outright. Um, said, you know, we're not gonna allow our employees to use this platform. So in response, um, Zoom has responded to the scrutiny uh, by freezing, uh, at one point, freezing all feature rollouts to work on security issues. And as a security engineer at a non-security software company, I just wanna like, I've been thinking about this ever since I heard about it because this is pretty amazing that they halted all of their feature development and just put all of their focus on these security issues. Um, I'm not trying to be a Zoom apologist and I'm also, I'm kind of video conferencing platform agnostic, but I think it's, it's pretty commendable that they took the time, you know, yes, they were getting hit with PR issues and things like that, but they took the time to remediate some of the issues that have been reported. Like they showed that they took it seriously. Um, and as a result, uh, we have Zoom 5.0 that was announced last week. Um, I think it actually might be getting released today, um, but there are a ton of new uh, security features and updates that they've included. Um, a couple of the big ones are uh, improved encryption um, and data routing control. So you can, you can define where your data is gonna be routed through country-wise. Um, and they've also released a lot of UX improvements as well. So they've made security options easier to get to. Uh, they've enabled the waiting room by default. They've increased uh, password complexity requirements by default, turned that on by default. Um, I'd encourage you to read their blog posts release about it just if you're curious. Um, and of course, every organization has to decide for themselves what, um, what's right for them. But I think, you know, the goal for us this week was really to cut through some of the, some of the hype and everyone's been very, very down on Zoom. And, you know, it's understandable. They've had some issues, but I think it's important to, to realize that they've also addressed it. They've at least made a pretty, pretty great effort to step up and say, we're paying attention and we're listening. Um, so next slide. And real quick, uh, I just want to say one of our attendees, Don, mentioned that fi Zoom 5.0 was actually out yesterday and has been updated today. And the, awesome. Cool. Yeah, the, the 256 uh, GCM encryption apparently is going to be not available until May 31st due to a possible resource issue on their server side. So that's according gotcha. to one of our attendees who obviously is in the know. So with that, please. Cool. Take it away. 
cool. No, thank you. That's, that's awesome. Thank you for the update. That's good to know. Um, so cool. So shifting gears a little bit, um, we've talked a lot about, you know, remote work tool vulnerabilities and issues. Um, yeah. So one of the things that we uh, pointed out in part two of our advisory this week was a really interesting piece from a group called Arctic Security. Um, they did some research that uncovered, you know, uh, some things that can happen when you take uh, corporate laptops out from behind the, the corporate firewall. Um, so a lot of computers any given day in your network at work are infected with malware, but the firewalls and other network controls in place can help neutralize that threat. So they're not able to reach out to those uh, CNC servers or whatever else, um, making them effectively uh, not, the infection is not active, right? Um, but a shift to remote work means that these machines in many cases now are no longer behind a corporate firewall. Um, they're not protected in the same way. They're being used on home networks. Um, even you know, if there's a VPN involved, that's not always going to, to offer the protection that you, you would want it to. That's not the same as, as a network firewall. Um, and so really, it, something like this that could lie dormant and then uh, become active once a machine is taken outside the corporate network provides a really easy pivot for an attacker into a corporate network or into corporate um, systems. So. I will say, uh, as a piece of parting advice, um, if your organization is not doing regular AV scans, I, I think now would be a great time to adopt that practice. Um, you know, I know that might be hard to roll out and implement remotely, but um, ugh, better safe than sorry. Um, I think that would, that's going to be a critical way to catch something like one of these, these issues. Um, and quite honestly, it's probably worth assuming that you might already have some devices on your network that are actively compromised now that we're in this very different world of what work means. Um, so that's all I have for the advisory. Um, but I do want to say after this, uh, we're going to be releasing a best practices guide with resources and tips to help organizations. This is particularly geared toward um, small organizations or ones that don't have a huge budget for security. Um, to help protect themselves from COVID related threats. So stay tuned for that. It will be published on the threat blog where we post the uh, threat advisories. Um, and yeah, that's all I got. Thank you. And real quick, we do have a question. I think this is a good time to ask it, uh, not just of the coalition, but I'd be curious to know if Jose and uh, Morgan from Census have an answer to this as well. Uh, Susan would like to know if we are seeing attacks against specific entry points, now that we're talking about work from home and home networks, such as like RDP, or what about targeting of uh, SQL on-prem versus cloud? Uh, I know that, you know, we here in the coalition focus a lot on, you know, domains, uh, you know, and vetting those, but just if anybody from the coalition or census wants to answer this, I'd be curious. And I know Susan would be curious for the answer. And thank you. Hi. Um, you know, from our perspective, we see a lot of the infrastructure that is stood up. Um, we don't have a ton of visibility into what is act actually being exploited from um, kind of that attacker perspective. But uh, we will certainly talk about kind of in our um, presentation here, we do see RDP actually on a lot of COVID related infrastructure. And so um, that is something we do have some visibility into, but I'm also curious about if we're seeing a lot of new exploits around, around that, um, especially from a home office perspective. All right, thank you. Anybody from the yeah. coalition wanna answer, Susan? Because I know we focus heavily on, on the domain and IP side of things. Uh, you know, I mean, personally in my company, we have seen uh, a lot of companies spin up RDP and that's been a very serious issue because it's <laughs> why, you know, and, and pe people are just rushing, I think, to, to get that done. But Emily, uh, I see you unmuted yourself. Do you have a, <laughs> you have a comment here? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, like as you touched on, I mean, we are a little more focused on domains and things like that, but just from kind of a news collection standpoint, we, we've been seeing like, again, a lot of VPN exploits. Those are big things that we've been concerned about. Um, uh, RDP, of course, is always a concern, uh, never not a concern. Um, but really the things that we've come across specifically in our research for the advisory has to do more with like a VPN infrastructure and things like that. Um, that's not to say there's not a whole lot more happening, but that's just what we have, have come across so far. Gotcha. All right. Thank yeah, you. And just to, to tack on, um, we have a, a 
person at uh, Rapid7 who is looking at our honeypots and looking at this uh, actively. And so I don't want to steal his thunder too much because I think that he is either going to put out a blog post or maybe I'll ask him to speak here. Um, but a lot of what we've seen is, um, you know, not a significant uptick in uh, targeting broadly that, you know, attackers are still attacking. They're not attacking any less, um, but they're also not doing much more. Uh, right, it's it's pretty, uh, it's at a pretty steady state, um, at least from the perspective of uh, MS SQL, uh, MySQL, RDP, and uh, God SSH, which like SSH brute force has such a an absurd volume. If you've ever run an SSH honeypot, that it would be hard to notice an uptick. Um, because you're just getting hit with SSH brute force all day, every day, anyway. Um, so, yeah, I think that's at least my my perspective. But I will say legitimate RDP use is definitely way up. Yes, most definitely. And I will also say this. Uh, Emily's uh, uh, advisory team actually put out a report the other week uh, that was basically saying that we're seeing all of the normal you know, kind of attacks that we always see. They're just using uh, COVID-19 as the lure, uh, but a lot of the traditional methodology that we see as threat is just being basically rebranded. So take that for what it's worth. And Susan, thank you very much for the, uh, for the question and we can move on. Great, yeah. So Morgan and Jose, you guys can uh, take it away. Thanks, uh, Jose Nazario. Um, I'm with Census now about a year and a half here with Morgan. Hello, nice to meet everyone. I'm with Census about a year. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a year this week, isn't it? It is. Yes. Yeah. Um, so this presentation is really about the data that we've gathered at Census um, on the whole uh, COVID and coronavirus themed infrastructure. The title of this actually came out of a comment from Morgan as we were preparing for this. This idea that, you know, uh, as you saw in Emily's slides, just this great deluge, this flood of infrastructure themed with coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, and using our data sets, we were actually able to dig into this a little bit. We found some interesting stuff. Morgan alluded a little bit to it um, a moment ago about the RDP infrastructure that we're seeing associated with this. She's got some really interesting visualizations and data analysis I wanted to, to bring to the group here. Uh, but real briefly, um, what is Census? Um, we're a small Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan-based startup, all currently working at home, as you might have figured out by this point. Um, I think we're on like week six or seven of working at home at this point. Um, but you might have known us from the Scans.io project or ZMAP. A um, couple of grad students, David and Zakir, uh, really wanted to be able to measure the internet um, and sort of watch it change. And it required more or less developing a, a sort of a high-speed camera and sort of a recording device. And that's what ZMAP and eventually Scans.io became. Um, so it's a V4, IPv4 full sweep um, continuously of the internet. Um, that data is available. You can sort of query that at any time. Um, we break out the data quite a bit. So you get these very structured, precise kinds of queries. We also record every certificate, every TLS certificate that we see, either from certificate transparency logs or from our scans as well. So not just uh, ones that are published, but also self-signed certificates or vendor supplied certificates, that kind of thing. And again, we tie those to infrastructure. And so this gives you this really great view into the internet. And we launched a product last year uh, based upon that data set. So, uh, it's a tax service management platform that we actually leveraged in part to look at the attacker's infrastructure um, and this COVID-19 themed infrastructure here. The gist is that it really mines our data set um, for information about the organization's digital estate. So give it some net blocks or domains. We gave it tens of thousands of COVID-19 based domains. Um, and then sort of from there, we can basically pull out that infrastructure from our, um, from our uh, our data sets provide you these really rich insights. But obviously, if you're defending yourself, uh, you'd probably want to start with your own networks and domain names. So as Emily pointed out, 
truckload of these domains uh, were registered. A lot of websites went up. Um, and just like Emily talked about, we didn't really spend a lot of time trying to score them and the reputation. Um, and so um, it's take, so take it for what it is. There's no sort of judgment placed upon top of it, but we think this data can also give you some insights just if you were to try to differentiate exactly what's going on. Is this attacker infrastructure, scammer infrastructure, uh, benign infrastructure, or even you know, more sort of official infrastructure? Really, I think we can help you sort of determine some of these things as well um, with our data set. Uh, but I do want to talk quickly about CentusBot. This is one of the resources that we made available to the uh, uh, CCTC. Uh, this is an application, a Slack app, that lets you more or less sort of dip into our data set by IP address. It's designed really for these IOC workflows or indicator workflows. Anybody can invite it to a channel or even just begin DMing it. Um, it's available on the Slack. It's, I didn't publish it to the Slack app directory, so it's not in other Slacks. Um, but as you can see, it sort of looks and sees an IP address, it parses that out with a regex, and then makes a query to census and tells you a little bit more about it. it tells you the open ports, web page titles, TLS certificate information, et cetera. And the objective is really to help you um, sort of learn more about it quickly as part of a workflow, some information, some insights, but also um, with some of this information, figure out uh, who might own it. So if it's, uh, for example, infrastructure, um, who, who owns it, uh, who, who should we wrap this, this uh, follow up to? What box might it be internally if we see, for example, an RDP certificate that typically has a uh, Windows host name associated with it? It lets you sort of know it's this host and this, this building, this floor, et cetera. Uh, let's actually go and, and do something about that. So now, on to the meat of our infrastructure uh, insights uh, portion here. Um, we did sort of a, a dig back in mid March of the COVID-19 and coronavirus uh, name certificates, just a big, simple sort of grep, if you will, over our data set. And here it is sort of, you know, domains or uh, certificates issued by day. So this is a subset in some cases of those domains that have been registered. Maybe these are gonna be Let's Encrypt, these might be, um, you know, cPanel ones or what have you. But again, looking at the names that the certificate is, is tied to, we can pull these out of our data set here. And again, um, all this really pointed to is that there's, you know, quite, quite a bit out there. So at this time, I think we're seeing maybe 30 a day or so, not that many, uh, but really sort of, again, that subset of the, of the uh, 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 domain names that we saw there. And then about a week later, we sort of did some analysis of, um, sort of early analysis that we're gonna talk about here with Morgan's work, shoved it into Tableau and sort of looking at sort of what those names map to for infrastructure, looking at the clouds that are in use, the um, uh, uh, certificate providers, the domain name registrations and the like, and the insights there. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Morgan. She's got a fantastic Tableau workbook with this data set in it. Sure. Right. Let me get my screen share all set here. Oops, one second. Let me undo my screen share. <laughs> there we go. Sorry about that. Goes. No worries. Um, okay. So, you know, we pulled this and these were um, names that we had found um, in the beginning of April. So they're, you know, about a month old at this point. But we, as kind of Jose had said, mining for related infrastructure of this, we're looking at, you know, IPs that we see associated with those names. Um, we've got some details and certs as well. So from, you know, this kind of networking perspective, we're trying to understand, you know, what does this infrastructure look like? Um, with this surge of COVID content, you know, there's there's certainly some kind of insights here, of like wow, you know, what do we see in terms of um, ports open, protocols running, et cetera. So first off, we kind of grouped together um, a bunch of the different kind of services we saw running, uh, highlighting some of the more risky ones. Right off the bat, you know, there's a kind of a surprising amount of MySQL databases that we saw related to this infrastructure. Uh, we can kind of highlight that also and start to look at where we see these pop up. So, you know, distributed fairly heavily across across the world. Um, you know, looking here, mostly concentrated as we're kind of scrolling down. I'm not sure if you can see that in the U.S., but you know, there's there's just the prevalence of that kind of um, protocols that we're seeing as we're scanning for those names and those IPs associated with that. Uh, I know we had mentioned RDP, so we can highlight that as well. Um, 
you know, RDP, we're seeing about 0.3% of all of the hosts that we found associated with this infrastructure um, running and, you know, RDP and having that exposed. Uh, a lot of that, as we're looking kind of at general distribution here, let me again, sorry, I got two scrolling windows, always the complication. Um, you know, we're seeing that present in a handful of different countries as well. Um, you know, some kind of coming out of the UK, Sweden, Singapore, Russia. Uh, what also is interesting though, kind of about this is obviously there's some more risky services associated with this infrastructure. You know, what does that mean? Does that point to, um, you know, any telling story about those domains? Probably still to be told, but as we look at um, also some cloud detail of like where these IPs are hosted, um, we can get some kind of layered insights as well. So I know we had mentioned, I think in the Slack channel earlier, there was some discussion around Colo Crossing as kind of a, a data center. Um, we see, let's see, you know, a handful of IPs that are based uh, kind of or hosted in Colo Crossing, again, this is about a month old at this point, but, um, you know, and generally what we're also seeing here is, you know, we see some of the more risky services that are running on IPs, um, you know, are being hosted in that Colo Crossing infrastructure. So, you know, we see two hosts that have FDP open on it. Um, we've got a handful that, you know, one that has RDP, for example, is also hosted in Colo Crossing. So, Potentially some some indications here of just levels of risks that can be aggregated, and you know we can certainly point out um, point out some interesting insights from that data if anyone is interested. Uh, Morgan, real quick, we've got a question on your data set here. Sure. Uh, this is from EOS S I M E. I don't know how to pronounce that, <laughs> so uh, and I apologize. Um, but uh, basically, the question is timeline for Morgan's data all of April. Great. So yes, we pulled these names um, back in the beginning of April. So this was kind of things that we had, I think it was a week span actually around that time. Um, and so we, it is kind of segregated to saying, hey, we, we pulled these in the week, we ran it and kind of pulled what we saw as a result of that one day. Gotcha. Um, we did try to update these kind of recently and the just surge of content that has happened over the past month um, was astronomical. So we can certainly, people had specific interest in a certain day period, um, reach out to us after and we can, we can talk about how we can get that data into your hands too. Cool, thank you. I, I've got a question, I probably just missed it, but in case anybody else missed it too, like how are you, how is this in, in infrastructure getting filtered? Like are you looking for like, like COVID like substrings and like domain names mm -hmm. or like, like in what sense is it, are they COVID related? Great question. Yeah, so we specifically were looking for names that had, um, you know, COVID-19, coronavirus, gotcha. um, okay. subset present. And then we okay. fed those into that system. So um, from there, we're just saying, hey, what, you know, what IPs are we seeing hosting these names? Are we seeing certificates that are running on those IPs? Um, and, you know, if we see certificates with COVID in their names, are we seeing those living on IPs? Okay. So that's the basic, we're doing, you know, a handful of pivots there, but uh, kind of filling out that infrastructure is, is comprised mostly of, you know, some DNS sources and Hulu sources and uh, pivoting from domain to IP. Cool. Yep. Any other questions on this? No, no, we're good. Thank you. All right. So we can talk a little bit about certificates as well. Um, you know, no surprise here, but most of the certificates we see associated with COVID infrastructure are issued by um, Let's Encrypt. Uh, at this point too, you know, we were looking both to see A, are the certificates valid? And B, um, do we see signs of heavy self-signed usage? So overwhelmingly, you know, self-signed wasn't a ton. It was like 1.6% of all the certificates we saw um, were self-signed there. And then, you know, in terms of validity, uh, most of them did appear to be valid. Um, and then, you know, looking also at certificate expiration timeline, this is kind of probably as expected as well. We see that major surge that's about 30 or 90 days out from um, kind of that initial spike related probably to those Let's Encrypt certificates. Uh, but then we also see a handful that kind of come later, uh, March, 2021, so. Um, and then this is fairly similar to kind of some of the stuff Emily was showing earlier, but um, in terms of names, you know, we just are seeing a, a huge amount of names being registered. Uh, you know, 
Additionally, we're seeing kind of that expiration focus predominantly a year out from now. Um, and, you know, looking just at the, the specific registrars that are most prevalent, uh, we're seeing, you know, GoDaddy and Name.com, but there's, there's a handful of other ones as well that kind of come up, the RU Center, um, you know, so, so it's, it's definitely distributing across a, a, a good chunk here of different registrars. And I'm sure, you know, as we rerun this, uh, with time goes on as those um, qualifications get a little more strict on like what it takes to register a name, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this changes over time as well. So um, are there any other questions I can help kind of expose with this or, um, you know, anything else here? I'm not seeing anything from, uh, from the attendees, but I don't know about the panel, so. All right. Well, you know, we will certainly, we can uh, kind of export these views and share them also in the Slack channel after. So if you guys are also looking for kind of any additional questions, feel free to reach out to myself or Jose. Um, you know, we can certainly get those answered for you. Yeah, this is really interesting data, Morgan. And um, yeah, I think if you, if you export the views, I think um, in particular, our data science team would be really interested in, in having a look. Um, Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And do. All right. Well, thank you guys. Awesome. Well, uh, since we don't have any other questions, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Morgan and Jose. Thank you, Nick, Emily, and Josh. Um, and we do have one more question before you go through the thanks. Oh yeah. <laughs> slide this in under the radar. All right. So Jonathan Frakes, hopefully, possibly from Star Trek, says, uh, uh, like to know if false positives are factored into the registrar report. Mm. Um, so that's a good question. We really didn't do a ton of sanitizing in terms of false positives. You know, we were really just kind of pulling, hey, where did we see this um, enriched? Jose, do you know specifically the enrichment that we're using for the registrar data? So we do, um, we buy Whois uh, data, I think, from like Whois XML API. Um, but in terms of the candidates that come in, you know, if it's Corona beer or whatever, you know, whatever, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's true. That might be a, or, you know, COVID-19 beer or something like that, um, that might show up in here. But just looking at the, um, if, for example, an Aquatone report, um, judging based upon that, most of these appear to be, almost all of these appear to be legitimately tied to the current pandemic as opposed to just arbitrary corona COVID names. Thank you. A great question. Awesome. I, I think that's it. Well, then uh, I already thanked you. That's you only get one. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and yeah, if, if anything else comes up, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, yeah, have a great day. Have a great weekend. And uh, we'll see every single one of the 77 attendees who are still watching uh, back here next week. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.